uh, with Priscilla and with Dr. Don Ganim. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, Dr. Don Ganim is, uh, is an expert in infectious disease. Um, a quick background, if you'll, if you'll allow, is um, you, you're a professor at UCSF, uh, the great medical school in the, in the area where um, Priscilla also went. And um, after that, led the whole um, infectious disease program um, at Novartis, developing drugs. And since then, more recently, uh, the way that, that, that I've gotten to know you is um, you've been an advisor uh, to the Biohub. That, uh, that that Priscilla and I um, helped to invest in and, and helped to spin up uh, that that's a medical research and, and science research organization uh, based in the Bay Area as a partnership between UCSF, Stanford, and, and Berkeley. So um, we're, we're really glad to have you with us today. Um, and we're hoping to talk about a, a number of topics related um, specifically around what kinds of uh, medical interventions are going to be possible here to address uh, COVID-19. Um, I figure we'll we'll spend some time talking about testing and and what needs to happen there, and um, medically and scientifically, what uh, what are the challenges there that need to get addressed. And then I figure we should we should talk about um, developing therapeutics. Um, you know, for people who are sick, uh, what are the possible strategies for uh, for basically uh, addressing that, minimizing symptoms, making sure it's not fatal, making sure it ha doesn't have long-term um, repercussions. And then we should spend some time talking about a vaccine and, um, and, and basically what it's going to take, what the process is going to be, um, and what goes into uh, building a, a vaccine that can, that can reach people around the world. Um, so that should take us through, I think, the, you know, the, the whole 40 or 45 minutes that we have. Uh, but I figured maybe we should just start off... Um, with a little bit of context, and if, if you're if you're up for it, you know you've worked on a lot of different uh, pandemics during your career, um, and you, you're also uh, a historian in the area, uh, very focused on on learning the lessons of of history and how um, different countries and cities have, have managed uh, different outbreaks as they've happened in the past. So I, I wonder, maybe you can just give us a few minutes on um, on what you've learned from past uh, outbreaks that you've been a part of fighting. Uh, that that are relevant today to to the scientific and public health response. And thank you again for joining. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark and Priscilla. Um, yeah, I am an amateur medical historian and uh, or camp follower of medical history, really. And and I think one of the reasons I I am very attracted to this subject is there's a lot to learn from history. You know, we all think we're the first generation to go through something like this. Um, you know, I'm on my fourth. Or maybe even fifth epidemic um, uh, in my lifetime, uh, and uh, you know, in my adult medical career, I've lived through um, uh, the HIV epidemic, the 2001, 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, and now this. Um, not to mention observing SARS and MERS at a distance. So you know, one has a chance to really reflect on what we can learn from these things, and I, I think there's a lot to learn here. But I'll keep it simple. The first thing to learn, and this is, I think, for everybody in the country to know, um, is that this history puts the lie to the statement that we often hear, um, that no one could have seen this coming, that, that this is unprecedented and no one could have seen it coming. Um, 1918 influenza was strikingly similar to this. Yes, there were some differences in age groups affected, but really the overall pattern of 1918 influenza was terrifyingly similar to this. And, uh, uh, and we had recent warnings that, that things like this could happen and could get out of control from SARS and MERS, very serious, even more lethal infections than, than, than the present coronavirus. Uh, so I, I think knowing that much about history should tell you that it's not the case that nobody could have seen this coming. And that, you know, in fact, in past administrations, uh, there was a lot of attention being paid to um, pandemic preparedness. Uh, so that's the first lesson is that nothing is genuinely new um, and these things have happened before. But without beating that drum too much, I think there are lots of more specific things we can learn from the 1918 epidemic, which was a devastating epidemic. Uh, you know, the total death toll from 1918 was I think 637,000 people dead, Americans dead, okay? That was at a time 
when the population of this country was around 105 million, one third what it is today. Okay. So uh, now, of course, there were many reasons why the mortality was so high. Uh, there were no antibiotics. There was no ICU care. There, there were no ventilators. We couldn't measure blood oxygen back then. Uh, right. So we, we really were at a very primitive stage of our understanding. But um, so, so there are many reasons to think that our death toll won't reach those numbers. Um, but um, uh, the fact is that, that the situation got so bad in 1918 that people were forced to innovate with things like social distancing. Now, in 1918, the epidemic spread from the East Coast to the West Coast. So Midwestern cities had more time to prepare and more time to learn from things that happened in the East. Um, and there's a particularly instructive, so there was a lot, just as today, there were a lot of political controversies about whether it was wise to shut down schools, churches, public gatherings, sporting events, theaters. Um, there was a lot of concern about the economic consequences of that. Um, but historians have gone back over this uh, in great detail because records from that era were very, very well kept. And we know exactly how many people died every week. And there's this interesting comparison between Philadelphia and St. Louis. So Philadelphia was hit earlier and they had less uh, time to prepare. Um, but the, the, governor, the mayor of Philadelphia did a reasonably good job about closing schools and theaters, uh, bars and restaurants. Um, but he acceded to demands of local politicians that they have a big parade in the middle of the epidemic. Um, because remember, this was during World War I, and there were, there were these patriotic parades to raise money for what were called liberty bonds, war bonds. So they had a gigantic parade down main, the main streets of Philadelphia. And the photographs from there, you know, will remind you of Mardi Gras in New Orleans today. There's that high density of people out there for many hours watching this parade go by. Um, and so despite having done a half-hearted uh, work on social distancing, allowing that congregation to happen in the middle of this outbreak uh, resulted in Philadelphia having a, a twice the death rate of, of St. Louis, which had a very early and widespread and complete shutdown and didn't accede to the Liberty Bond Parade. Um, so that most of those, I mean, it's a striking recapitulation of the public debate we're having now of business people and, and tradesmen and economists saying, let's not do it. Um, doctors and public health people saying, let's do it. Mayors going in either direction. But the, the lessons from there are fairly clear. Cities like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia that didn't do it rigorously or did it late or, or, or didn't do it at all had twice the death rate of places like uh, like St. Louis that did. So I think that gave us a lot of confidence going into this, that social distancing can work. And of course, now we have many more tools that allow social distancing to be done more effectively, not the least of which are social media and uh, video conferencing and teleconferencing and things that make it easier for at least some parts of the economy to continue to function. Um, so so what are those are the types of lessons you can learn. Don, so, so uh, with social distancing, uh, we're doing, uh, we're extrapolating some of the lessons learned of that it is in fact helpful. Um, but what are some of the advantages that we have today in addition to ICUs that can help us actually be more effective uh, against our current pandemic? Yeah, well, I mean, we're in a whole different situation. We have knowledge of what, I mean, they didn't even know what a virus was back then. Back in 1918, the, there, was, there was rudimentary bacteriology. We knew a lot about bacterial causes of disease. And back in 1918, the organism that was mistakenly thought to be the cause of that epidemic was Haemophilus influenzae, a bacterium that we now know produced a, a secondary bacterial pneumonia that complicated a lot of influenza. They mistook it for the primary cause. So we're in a much better position. We have advanced virology, genomics. We, you know, within weeks of the first reports of cases in China, there was a published nucleotide sequence of the genome, uh, now all you know, widely disseminated all over the earth. Um, we have that to work with from the point of view of expressing viral genes that could be candidate vaccine elements. We can express those antigens and raise antibodies to them as potential therapeutics. We can, uh, we now have a, a fast cell culture systems for growing virus that allow us to test compounds for their antiviral activity. We'll get into all of that later. But those are you know, huge advantages that make possible the rapid deployment of testing, um, 
the ability to culture the organism to rapidly know what we're dealing with, to make antigens, uh, and to test for uh, test current candidate vaccines and and uh, and therapeutics. Not to mention the development of PCR-based diagnostics. Um, so and those so are huge. We have a question for some um, some some folks. Anne, uh, will there be a second wave as occurred with the Spanish flu? Yeah, let's be the first to say we don't know for sure, but the prudent thing would be to count on the idea that we there will be a recrudescence. There may well be a recrudescence in the fall, um, in the late fall. Um, why do we think that? Just based on our experience with other uh, respiratory infections. You know, when, once respiratory infections are widespread like this, they tend to be seasonal, worse in the November to April interval and better in the summertime. Now, the truth is we have no good understanding of why that is. We know about a few things that govern that. During the winter in the temperate climates, people are closer together, um, packed closer together at home. They go outside less. Uh, so there are more opportunity for spread in the household than in schools. Um, you know, whereas in summertime when schools are on vacation, the kids are, 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 are dispersed from one another. A school, by the way, is one of the highest density situations in which human beings find themselves. Um, you know, slums in certain parts of the developing world and schools all over the world are places where the density of human packing is unprecedentedly high. Military barracks in most armies are, with recruits are like that too. Uh, those, so when school is out and those kids are at a lower density, they're not swapping um, infections among, passing infections among each other. When they come back to school in the fall, you often see outbreaks of respiratory disease uh, in them and then in their parents, as you well know, probably from having kids yourself. So those are some of the things that go into it. Barometric pressure and temperature does have something to do with transmissibility, but we don't understand what that is. And then of course, when, when epidemics, when respiratory disease does fall into this seasonal pattern, um, you have the fact that prior epidemics of related viruses uh, increase the amount of immunity that's in the general population. So disease becomes somewhat less severe um, as the population develops greater and greater levels of immunity. We'll come back to all that when we talk about vaccination, but, but those are parts of what um, contribute to seasonality. But you know, when I was an editor at the Journal of Virology years ago, I was in charge of the mini review section. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have an article for prof by professional virologists for other virologists about seasonality of respiratory infection. And what I discovered in editing such a, a piece is we really know very little about it and there's a lot of speculation and very few facts. But I think based on the, the trends of past respiratory epidemics, we could pretty much just, I think it would be prudent to count on the likelihood that there will be a recrudescence in the fall. If it doesn't happen, great. But I think we should get the public ready for that. Um, because it's likely to happen. All right, so I wanna make sure that we spend the majority of the time here talking about um, medical interventions and, and, um, and, and things that, uh, that, that scientists and, and medical researchers are working on. So probably the first area to focus on is testing. And here, there's a question about what needs to happen right now um, what are the bottlenecks to that in terms of uh, science or technology? And, and then um, we should get into some of the questions around um, what's the path forward and what are some of the technologies or, or scientific work that needs to get done to allow the kind of testing that we want to have in place, you know, a month, two months from now. Um, do, do you want to you get us started on, yeah. on today? So um, today, uh, uh, Joe and the team at the Biohub announced that they're offering testing to all the count, Bay Area County Departments of Public Health free of charge. But we know that that's a small piece of what needs to happen overall in testing. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what testing is available now and how you think it should be deployed in the community and what needs to come next for testing? Yeah, yeah. so I don't know how much to assume from the audience, but let's just read. First of all, what is testing for? And um, um, what is testing measure and what are the uses to which we want testing to be put? And uh, so those are all slightly separate questions with a lot of overlap. I mean, testing, there, there are several different testing formats. The test we're using now, which is a PCR-based test, is to detect the viral genome. 
Now, the viral genome is only present in people during the time they're sick. Um, there's a, a brief window before they're sick when they're incubating infection, in which the genome is present. And then during the illness, the immune response starts to kick in and the virus is gradually eliminated. So by the time people are over the symptoms, um, they no longer have the virus. So the window for viral detection in the respiratory tract is a couple of weeks, give or take. Um, um, and once that window is passed, you can't, the, the test has no further illuminative value, right? You can, once somebody's over the, the, the Ill infection, the PCR is gonna go back to being negative as it was before. So if you, so this test is useful for diagnosis. It's useful for counting the number of affected people, but it's not a, it's a very cumbersome test to use on a population. First of all, the test itself is very sophisticated. It requires very sophisticated instrumentation um, and therefore is subject to a lot of regulation from federal regulators. That reduces the number of labs that are competent to do it, the number of labs that are licensed to do it. And it requires that doctors send the specimens from the bedside to, um, from their office or clinic to some one of these reference labs. It's not easy to deploy that test. And you know we're discovering that. Um, we are painfully rediscovering that now. Uh, even with a massive effort, um, it, it takes time to ramp up a test like that and use it. And the test is really primarily useful for diagnosis and monitoring people who are sick, okay? Um, if we wanna know, uh, now there are other tests that measure different things. Um, I mentioned that once people get over the infection, whether they were symptomatic or not, uh, they have an immune response uh, that shows up in the blood as uh, as the presence of antibodies in the circulation. And those antibodies will stay up for months or years after infection. And therefore they are extremely useful for enumerating who in the population has ever had the infection, whether they're actively infected or not, right? Um, uh, and that's a test that's only just now coming online, but is sensitive, inexpensive, easy to do, and can be deployed much much more broadly than a PCR test that requires a lot of sophisticated instrumentation. And so that's a test that is very useful for a lot of things. So, uh, and that test is coming online now. Um, uh, and I know the Biohub is working on a very nice uh, format version of that test. Uh, uh, and we're planning to study that test very soon. Now, what can you use that test for? Well, you, first of all, you can use it to detect who's ever been exposed in the population. Why might that be interesting? Well, you could go around, you can use this test on thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people if you need to. And, um, and that can tell you where there has been a lot of viral activity and where there has been relatively little. Um, and by using this serially, you can map hotspots of infection and know where they're, where they're headed. Once you reach a population that has 70, 80, 90% seropositives, you know that the infection has already swept through that population and you're gonna, you're gonna to have to need to do less PCR monitoring in a population like that than you would in a population that was highly susceptible and, uh, um, and had no antibody. Um, so we'll come back to how this might be part of a strategy for getting out of um, the lockdowns that we're in. I've given that a lot of thought. And, um, um, but those are the two genres of tests that are available. Um, now, uh, could that change? Yeah, and it probably will. Uh, there is another technology for detecting the viral genome um, that is based on a technology called CRISPR technology. And um, I won't go into the details, but it is this, this application of CRISPR technology was first discovered in 2018. So it is extremely new, and, uh, but it is very sensitive for the scientists in the audience. It has femtomolar sensitivity for detection of the genome. That's real sensitive. Um, you're not gonna miss a lot of people with this test. And it has the virtue that it can be deployed, that the test can be read out in 20 minutes or a half an hour in the appropriate format. Um, so there are a, now a number of small companies, startup companies that are trying to commercialize this technology and uh, uh, disclosure time. I have no financial or other ties to any of those companies, okay? Um, so I just, I'm, I'm not shilling for this. I'm just pointing out as a scientist, there's something very attractive about CRISPR-based gen genome detection, which is it's potentially deployable at the point of care, okay? So those of you who have young children know when they've got a sore throat, you can go to the doctor's office and have a rapid strep test. Um, um, and that test will read out in 20 minutes in the doctor's office or less. Um, and you can be sent home that day knowing whether you do or don't have a strep throat. 
Well, this test has the capability of doing that for viral detection. Um, and it doesn't require, even though the test is very sophisticated and requires a lot of, um, uh, of advanced knowledge to set it up, the components can be put in a simple box uh, such that it could be deployed by someone who isn't a certified lab technolo technologist. The, the capability of doing this in a doctor's office with a nurse or a nurse practitioner, or even possibly in a, in a school with a school nurse taking charge or an industrial setting with the, with the industrial hygiene nurse or the occupational health nurse doing some of this testing at the point of care. Um, you know, that's, um, that's a test that isn't yet available, but the technology exists and companies are hard at work commercializing this. And I cannot imagine that in the context of COVID-19, they aren't all working day and night to try to stand that test up. And uh, if they do, then it, it makes possible a whole other form of testing. Because uh, in my view, the next, you know, to come out of the lockdown, we're gonna need to move testing away from cumbersome hospital and laboratory based settings to the points of care, and even to these places where non-physicians might be able to do the test. Now, I don't advocate doing this at, at home because I'm afraid if we go to home-based testing like this, which a lot of entrepreneurs are interested in, um, I worry that the worried well will start hoarding the test kits and testing themselves every other day when it's not necessary. And we might wind up with supply chain problems that would make it difficult for the institutions and places that need point of care testing to get access to it. But that's a debate we can have. One day home testing might become a reality, but I think what I, the really important thing is to move testing out of these highly regulated clinical laboratory settings to the community. So one of the topics, if that, that was a, that's a good summary of the different types of testing. The, um, the, the PCR testing, if you're currently sick, the um, serological or antibody testing, if you've been exposed to this in the past, and a potential CRISPR approach, which um, we don't have yet, but, but could be very practical um, if, if that, and, and accurate if, if, it, if it were to come to pass. Um, one of the things that we're very focused on is the serological and antibody testing. Um, that yeah. is important for the public health strategy um, for, you know, as, we start looking over the next few weeks towards um, how can society start opening up again? It's not gonna be necessarily everyone at once. Um, so being able to identify who is um, has antibodies is gonna be helpful. Um, it'll also help answer some of the questions like you're, you're saying around, um, around what percent of the population overall has been exposed to this and has some, some immunity to it now, um, even if they hadn't had symptoms. So yeah. from your perspective, you said that this was starting to roll out now. What are the major um, questions and, and challenges ahead in that and getting that to be deployed broadly? Are, there, are they scientific? Are they, um, are, are they kind of distribution questions? What, what, are, what are the big things that you're focused on there? Yeah, I don't see a lot of impediments to the widespread dissemination of serologic testing. These tests format wise are very simple to do. They're traditional tests. And, um, and I think that's, the questions are not, it, this is not going to be difficult in the way that rolling out widespread PCR testing was, was difficult. They're inexpensive. The, the formats are um, already familiar to all the, the manufacturers and the, the, there aren't a lot of bells and whistles here. Um, I think the real issue for us right now um, is to make sure. Right, that there. If that's the right. case, then why, if that was the case, then why has it taken to this point to develop it? Oh, well, um, there, there's a bunch of things that have to happen. Um, you have to have, in order to make a test for antibody, you have to be able to express the antigen. Um, you have to figure out which antigens you're interested in. In the, you know, the antigens are proteins encoded by the virus. You have to decide which of those are most sensitive for detection of the immune response. Um, you have to then express those, get them in a high state of purity, format the test, and then you have to validate the test uh, which means you have to make sure it detects with high sensitivity all the people who've recovered from infection and doesn't falsely detect people who've never been exposed. That means you have to have standards, um, uh, sera from people who have convalesced. Well, until recently, we didn't have any convalescent people in the United States. Um, 
they were in Italy or before that they were in China. So, so some of these pedigreed cereal had to be imported here. Standards had to be created. It takes a few weeks to get all that machinery up and running. But now that those things are coming online, there are very few structural barriers to disseminate, to standardizing, validating, and approving such a test and getting it online. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not expert enough to tell you exactly how many weeks that's going to take, but, but those are the things that go into the, de the delays that one experience. You just can't make this up out of whole cloth. And even knowing the sequence, um, uh, you know, you can synthesize peptides, but really you, you want expressed whole proteins for this to be the, the optimal format. Um, but your question raises uh, things I do want to talk about here, um, which are we need to, before we go and, and, and validate a whole bunch of these tests and then go out and start using them, we need to make sure we understand what the tests are telling us, okay? Because I'm already hearing in the lay press and on, on television, commentators who are equating antibody positivity with immunity. And um, we should recognize the fact uh, that not all antibodies are protective against an infection. Uh, they're all made in reaction to infection. Some of them have protective value and some of them don't, okay? So one way of looking at this is which ones can neutralize the ability of a virus to infect a cell and which ones can bind the virus but don't block it from an infection, okay? Neutralization is another word for blocking of infection. And um, um, so for example, in HIV, everybody makes antibodies to HIV. Everybody who's been exposed to HIV makes antibodies to it. But those antibodies do not have protective benefit for the most part. Only a very tiny subfraction of them are neutralizing and even those aren't always fully protected by themselves. So I think it's very important before we assume that everybody who has antibody is going to be immune that we validate that. It's very likely to be true. That is, that is the pattern in almost all the respiratory infections that we've seen to date is that when you recover, uh, there's at least limited or temporary immunity, um, uh, you know, enough to either make the next tool in past epidemics of respiratory infection. But, you know, uh, I think it's very important that we not say that because that happens with the common cold and the other coronaviruses that cause the common cold, that we're going to see that same level of immunity here. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to know which of the antibodies are responsible for that protection because they may not be the majority antibodies that some tests measure, okay? If there are five or six different proteins to which you're making antibodies, which of those antibodies are the protective ones and which are not? Uh, it may be that, um, you know, that, uh, well, I don't want to get too technical here, but I think these are the theoretical questions that we can answer very rapidly right now and that we need to have a secure answer to that um, before we just assume that everybody who's positive and every antibody test is okay to go into a high risk uh, area and and be a nurse or or a postman you know uh, delivering to high risk people um, so i think and there are certain straightforward ways to figure that out for the biohub has taken a lead here because I don't I don't see a lot of public discussion of this question. What are the protective antibodies and how, what what titer is necessary for protection? Um, you know, and I think we do, we've had recent discussions in the BioHub about exactly that question. Can I can I ask one clarifying question about the three types of tests that you've talked about? Is um yeah is the serological or antibody testing um, a superset of the PCR testing, or does it not include no. um, if you're currently actively sick? It's only for testing if you had it in, in the um, backward looking. Yeah, for the most part, people develop antibodies to the infection once they're on the mend, so-called convalescent antibodies. Uh, so really antibodies take a week to 10 days, sometimes 14 days to, to be, they start being made for about a week after exposure. Um, and they, but really they, they don't become measurable in the circulation at high levels until most people are already convalescing. This is why they're not terribly useful for diagnosis. When people are sick, they, they may or may not have antibodies around, um, but the antibody titer tends to rise as you convalesce, okay? So they're less useful for diagnosis. That you want the genomic test, the PCR test or CRISPR test, um, but they are useful as markers of who's had infection and who might have immunity. Okay, but what I'm trying to emphasize now is we need to know exactly which antibodies are conferring immunity 
and how regularly do they arise versus antibodies that just arose uh, to other subunits of the virus that don't have anything to do with immunity? So Don, maybe I can clear? summarize. Um, so what I'm hearing is what we have right now is a complex, hard to implement test that's PCR based that tells us it's helpful for the person and the doctors caring for them. Are you sick now? And that yes. in the future, there might be tests that are based on CRISPR technology that allow us to do that more quickly um, so that we can get the right information to the right people um, as soon as possible. The serologic right. testing tells us who has been sick, which is less yes. important for the person immediately, but important for us as we think about how to reopen society and who potentially has immunity. Mm -hmm. exactly. Is that right? That's exactly right. So I wanna um, raise a question from Jennifer, uh, which is I think a, you, what your comments on antibodies raises and probably raises for a lot of people. Does this mean I can get this more than once? Um, it, uh, again, yeah. so, I know you don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, well, uh, for most respiratory infections, um, uh, like some of the earlier coronaviruses that are linked to the common cold, um, one typically does not get them more than once. Um, any given virus would confer immunity to that same virus, so you wouldn't get that one again. Now, there were two or three, there are, I think, four common cold coronaviruses, so you can get a a coronavirus four times, but each time it's a different one, right? Um, but but once you've gotten over all four of them, you're not likely to get them again. Now, uh, there's always for different infectious diseases, a question of how long immunity lasts for. For some diseases like polio, immunity lasts for a lifetime. If you get, over, if you get exposed to poliovirus and get over it, uh, you will have lifelong immunity from that. Um, for other viruses like so respiratory syncytial virus, which Immunity that usually lasts into adulthood. But by the time you're my age, that immunity has waned to the fact, to the point where those same strains can cause infection in the elderly and sometimes quite severe flu like illness in the elderly. Now, again, if, if, if that's how it works out for the COVID virus, uh, that'll be fine if immunity can last 20, 30, 40 years. That would be great. We just don't know. Um, and we're going to have to follow this and, and monitor this. And how would we do that? Um, uh, if you take a group of people who are antibody positive and you know they're being highly exposed, let's say healthcare workers in the ER or in the ICU, those are people who are going to be exposed over the next few years to many cases of, of coronavirus. Um, can we show that if you, if you follow them compared to antibody negative healthcare workers, do the antibody positive healthcare workers have a lower risk of developing an infection as judged by PCR or, or symptoms? Okay. If so, then you can conclude that those antibodies are protective and, that, and you can measure the duration of that by following these people over the years. Okay. So there are straightforward clinical studies that you can do um, to assess whether antibodies are protective, how protective they are, and how long that protection lasts. And what I'm advocating for, because I'm not hearing a lot of this conversation going on publicly, is we need to start doing those studies now. This is the perfect time to be doing it because we're in the middle of a great big epidemic. We know who the highly exposed people are. As we roll up this test, we can start ratifying healthcare workers according to whether they're antibody positive or antibody negative and, and watch and see what happens to their, um, their, their subsequent clinical events? Do they get sick? Do they develop, you know, if we follow them with weekly PCR, do we have um, a lower rate of PCR positivity in the antibody positives versus antibody negatives with equal amounts of exposure? These are straightforward studies to do right now. And I'm proud of the fact that the Biohub is, is thinking about launching such a study. Um, and I hope that this conversation will encourage other groups to do it all across the country, because this is essential information if we want to put our understanding of immunity on a firm footing. It's one thing to measure antibodies in the lab. It's one thing to say that they neutralize infection in the lab. And it's another thing to say that they confer immunity. They probably do. If I had to bet, I would bet my kid's college the whole subject of coronaviral immunity on a firm footing as we go forward. All right. So I want to make sure that we um, that we have a bunch of time to talk through drug development as well. Um, so let's move on from testing. 
And the, the two areas that I, that I okay. think we should make cover are one is um, this area around accelerating the testing of existing therapeutics to see if any of them um, work well or are effective um, for either preventing or mitigating symptoms for COVID. Um, and then we'll get to a vaccine at the end. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, it would be useful for you to take yeah. the audience through what the process is for considering all of the compounds that are out there um, that, that might potentially be useful for this um, and figuring out if any of them actually are statistically um, useful for this, if there are combinations of drugs, uh, like what we've seen with HIV, where you have a, a, a set of drugs together that, that um, kind of have compounding benefits. Um, what's the process for figuring this out? And, and, and also, what's the time frame um, for if, if we're optimistic um, or even just realistic, what should we expect uh, in terms of how this will play out? So there's two or three ways to go about this. Um, uh, one is to take all the drugs that we know have been licensed by the FDA for all conditions that are out there in medicine and, um, and test and see if by chance any of them happen to inhibit replication of the virus in, in culture. That is something that's very straightforward to do. Can be done in, nowadays can be done in academic labs, but even faster in an industry lab. Um, uh, this is often done with advanced robotic instrumentation. Um, make uh, dishes that have a thousand wells and fifteen hundred wells. Uh, if you have the fifteen hundred or so um, known FDA approved drugs, not just antiviral drugs, but anti-seizure drugs, anti-hypertensive drugs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that's been shown to be safe and effective for something in a human being, okay? Those tests take several weeks to do. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the test can be done in less than a week. Then you have to take the positives, confirm them. Then you have to uh, do a, a, a series of different doses to find out what is the effective dose. Um, uh oh, Don! It looks like we've we've uh, lost at least your video for a second. Um, we still connected? No, I, I think I think we lost Don. But um, but while he's coming back online, um, do you want to give a quick summary of of um, of, of what he just went through? Because it cut in and out, so it might have been hard for people to yeah. to see that. So what Don was talking about was the fact that um, right now it is possible to, in a, in a lab, in an academic lab or an industry, to use tests that have uh, what's called high throughput, which means on a single dish, you can test hundreds up to, uh, I think he was talking about a uh, plate that could plate 1500 drugs. And we're talking about all drugs, not just um, antibiotics or antiretroviral antivirals, but all drugs that have been proven to do something helpful in a human. And then what you look for, it takes about a week to do that initial test and see which drugs have efficacy against uh, the virus. And then it takes more time to sort of revalidate um, that positive. And then uh, I'm, Don's back. All right, Don, glad to have you back. We Was just, I an okay student there? We were just summarizing what you were saying. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, uh oh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting another message that our internet connects and getting the dose right. Um, now, it's important to realize that um, so one can do that for all the FDA approved drugs. Now, I've already seen one or two publications that have done that. Uh, already, okay, publication from France. And this is where hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin came from. Um, uh, there's a better approach to, to this that's more of the uh, uh, therapeutic accelerator, the COVID therapeutic accelerator that I know Bill Gates and the, and the initiative are both uh, funding. 
um, in which not only are, is one, one doing the exact same study, but including not only FDA approved drugs, but a whole bunch of other compounds that pharmaceutical companies are donating that they had been developing for other conditions um, for which they had safety data, um, but the drug didn't work for the condition it was being developed for, okay? Why are those interesting? They're interesting because we know these are things that can, that are orally bioavailable, that people can absorb and get into the circulation, um, that they're safe enough, um, you know, that they're not necessarily injurious. They have fewer side effects. They didn't happen to work. Let's suppose that one of these drugs was for high blood pressure. It didn't happen to lower blood pressure sufficiently. So it couldn't be a successful drug for that indication, but it was safe and it was available and it got into the circulation. So why not test compounds like that for, um, for efficacy? So this is a way to expand the panel of potentially useful things that could make it into a human right away. Uh, there's a very good chemical biologist at Scripps named Peter Schultz, who's, who's part of bigger, it's a bigger collection than just the FDA approved drugs. It also, that are known to inhibit certain biochemical reactions in cells and certain signaling pathways. Um, so all those compounds are being tested by a very, very good virologist in Europe, um, who uh, I know well personally, and who's, a, who's very competent. Um, and I think we can expect that study to roll out and be concluded in a couple of months. I, I don't know exactly what their time frame is. Uh, you may know better than I as a supporter of it, um, but that's an expanded version of what we just talked about. Um, and that, I, that is our best shot. Sorry, please continue. I mean, that's our best shot at getting a hit that might be deployable right away. Uh, yeah. You know, I have to tell you in all candor that repurposing studies like this don't have a great track record. Um, typically, they don't yield vir uh, antiviral compounds right away um, because what you often discover in this kind of exercise is something that's very busy and really isn't, isn't ready to be, you know, you can't get the levels of this that you need in the blood for antiviral activity. What these turn out to be is great starting points for new drugs, um, but they still have to undergo chemical modifications and testing. Um, now, what's good about that is at least you're starting out with a chemical compound that you know is soluble, um, is absorbed by people, is reasonably safe. That's a lot better than a lot of other chemical starting points that one starts out doing this just from scratch. Um, but still, you're talking about years away from um, being able to mature that into a therapy. So this is a very worthy, can be transposed directly into therapy right now. So, so that's a shot you, that's a shot on goal you just absolutely have to take, right? You can't not do something like this. I'm a hockey fan. And as Wayne Gretzky said, you're not going to score on a shot you don't take. And um, uh, so this is a shot. I just think we have to be realistic about not pinning all of our hopes on that. Um, but it's a shot that we absolutely have to take. And what I love about the way the Gates Foundation and you guys have set up here um, is this is the most intelligent approach to drug repurposing I have ever seen, because it includes a lot of things that aren't done in the standard FDA approval box alone, right? So that's a good thing. Let's take that shot. But, um, but I also think we need to think about what we're going to do with the drugs that the hits that come out of that. And I think we're already having a preview now with the two hits that have come out so far, which is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, you know, we, we have to prepare ourselves now for the debate about what to do with the information when these drugs come out. I think we should steal ourselves now um, for, um, for to discipline ourselves to say that at least in the beginning, we need to use these drugs in clinical trials so that we can find out whether they really do work or not. It's one thing to say they block replication in tissue culture, and it's another thing to say they work as antivirals in a human being. Now, let's take the case of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, uh, you know, of course, as a, somebody who practiced medicine for many years, I know that when you have a life-threatening illness and people are failing, there's a temptation and, an, and a desire to want to do everything you can to throw everything that you can that might be safe and might be effective at these. And I don't dispute 
that use, okay? That's a legitimate thing to do. And for docs who are out in the community, in a community hospital who have no alternatives at their disposal, perfectly reasonable to, to use the drugs that way. But I think we also have to make sure that at least in our academic centers and our university hospitals, we are simultaneously with that doing clinical trials in which there are randomized controls, in which people get the standard of care versus standard of care plus the drug. So we can find out, does the drug really work? And how effective is the drug? Is the drug going to be effective as monotherapy or do we have to use it in combination? And if so, what's the best combination? And there's even more important questions to be asking, which is not only does the drug work, yes or no, and how well does it work, but what is the optimal way to use the drug? So let's say the case of hydroxychloroquine. It's not a very potent compound. It's a micromolar inhibitor of replication. A lot of the drugs we use in, in clinical practice are nanomolar inhibitors. Um, so um, on the other hand, it is absorbed levels, micromolar levels are achievable in the blood. Um, so it's an open question whether this could be a good antiviral or not. Um, there's a reasonable scientific basis for trying chloroquine in this infection. But let's be honest, chloroquine also is active against dengue in culture. It's active against chikungunya in culture. And the clinical trials in both of those diseases were unsuccessful. So having it work in tissue culture is no assurance it's going to work in a human being. So and let me see if I even if it does that. work, let me, sure. let me just finish here. Even if it does work, is, is the very sick person in the ICU the best person to be using that drug on? Let me amplify on this because this is going to be a theme for a lot of antivirals. We know that the, the peak period of viral replication in this condition is early in the disease, when people are still either asymptomatic or very early once they've started to have a cough and a, and a, and a bit of a fever. <laughs> uh, slam kind of as, the wind, wind blew it. Uh -huh. And as the disease progresses, as people get sicker and sicker and get admitted to the hospital, viral titers tend to be going down um, by PCR. Uh, as they get sicker. And by a week or eight days into the illness, oftentimes it's hard to get any virus out of the patient by culture, although the PCRs are still positive, the genome is still around, but infectivity has gone way down. By the time people are at day seven, day eight, day nine of the illness, which is around the time that those who are destined to get very sick are being transferred to the ICU. Okay. Um, uh, now, if that's the case, um, does it make sense to be using antivirals in those very, very sick people in whom viral replication is already trending down? Or would it have been better to use it when they were still very mildly affected earlier in the disease when there is more replication, right? So now that's a very important question. Maybe um, a drug like hydroxychloroquine might be less effective used in advanced disease um, and might be more effective when used earlier in the disease. Or maybe it'll be the opposite, who knows? But the point is, that the only way you're gonna learn whether the drug works and how best to use it is in a, in a clinical trial setting. So I'm sympathetic to those people who want to use it in an uncontrolled setting, and I think that's okay, um, but we, all, we can't let that use supersede um, the use in a clinical trial. And that needs to be the case going forward for all the other hits that come out of the, the therapeutic accelerator. We have to commit to that, okay? And what I worry about is, is when there's a run on the drug like there is now, um, you get to a point where patients and their families don't wanna be randomized. They don't want to be in the control group. Um, and in which case a clinical trial becomes very difficult to do. And that's something okay. that people who are not clinicians don't think about. Don, I wanna make sure that we get to vaccines too. Do you wanna sure. just yeah. quickly summarize that for 30 seconds and then we can move on to vaccines? Yeah, so I just wanna, from the start is really that the, there are efforts, including the therapeutics accelerator where we're screening all drugs that are known to be safe in humans and seeing in a dish um, whether or not they're effective against coronavirus. That is not equivalent to being safe or effective, uh, sorry, not equivalent to being effective against coronavirus in a person. There are bioavailability questions. Yes. Um, there are questions about dosages and whether or not they're realistic. And also the fact that we need to um, know in a uh, trial setting, whether or not it is actually effective against the viral, the portion of illness that is attributable to the virus. Yeah, and then the advantage that testing existing compounds has is that they've already gone through trials for safety 
So you know that you're starting with something that will be safe if it is found to also be effective. So now let's, um, we only have a few minutes left. And the vaccine development, I think, is one of the most interesting long-term questions here. Um, so maybe just give, give a little bit of background on what's going to be necessary to get a vaccine. Um, what are the different strategies? I mean, you, you hear people focused on protein-based vaccines, RNA-based vaccines. What are those different kinds of things? So what are the different kinds of approaches? And then again, realistically, what are the timeframes that we're looking at here for having something that can be widely deployed? Yeah. So there are many different formats for inducing an immune response. You can try injecting directly into the muscle uh, RNA or DNA that encodes viral proteins. Though the advantage of that approach is that you can, you can start right away. The minute you know the genomic sequence, you can synthesize the gene in question and inject that right into the arm. So that's why those are the vaccines you're hearing the most conversation about when, when Dr. Fauci says on TV that, that these might be deployable in a year to 18 months. He's talking about the nucleic acid-based vaccines principally, which are already off to such a quick start because once you know the sequence, you just synthesize the gene and inject it into the arm. Um, now, the good news is that approach is fast. Um, the, the caveat here is that in influenza, where we have some experience with this, nucleic acid vaccines, DNA-based vaccines work very well in mice, but haven't worked so well in larger animals and humans. Um, uh, and we're not entirely sure why that is. They still got a shot here. Every infection is different. They might work here and you, you absolutely need to try it. But I think we can't rely on that just because it's quick doesn't mean it should be our only approach. I think this is a case where you want to be use, you want to be shooting every arrow in the quiver. That means um, protein-based vaccines. It means expressing uh, viral proteins and, and looking at their ability to induce an immune response. You have to choose which protein you want to use or which collection of proteins you want to use. I think in this case, we mostly want to use the surface protein of the virus because we know that's the thing that binds to the receptor and that binding to the receptor is imperative for infection and that that's an event that happens outside the cell and therefore can be blocked by an antibody. So using the spike like a protein or S protein, that's key. Um, and you can do that by either expressing S protein and, and purifying the protein in recombinant uh, yeast or higher cells and then um, injecting the pure protein into people. You could cr try growing up whole virus particles and inactivating them with chemicals or heat or detergent uh, and using the disrupted virus particle itself. It's no longer infectious to induce. That has the advantage of not making any guesses about what the optimal antigen would be, but is of course much more complicated to do and requires biosafety and containment. Uh, but a killed virus like that would be analogous to the salt vaccine for polio. And then there's other approaches where you take the viral gene for the surface protein and clone it into a harmless virus um, uh, that has been used for other vaccines like adenovirus or certain forms of smallpox vaccine. Um, and then you, what you're injecting into person is the adenovirus uh, that expresses uh, that envelope protein. So these are all possible strategies for vaccination. And what I would say is given the urgency of this situation, we should be, the government should be, um, and industry should be pursuing all of these lanes simultaneously. We don't have time to figure out, it, to make guesses in advance what's going to be the optimal approach. This is a very empiric subject. We need to test them all. Um, and I'm very confident that that's going to happen but we need to be sure that there's federal oversight of this and that every approach, every one of these approaches is being taken because even though some are faster than others, we really don't know what's gonna be the most successful approach. And uh, 18 months is the earliest any of these are gonna come online. Um, uh, but I, I think, you know, we've gotta make a full court press. Every arrow from the quiver needs to be shot. So are there approaches that you think are good ones that you're not seeing being tried right now um, by the well, major I'm government? Well, I'm, I'm not privy to all the trials that are going on because, you know, uh, this effort is getting ramped up now and um, it takes a while to make these recombinants, for example, or to express the proteins, uh, get them in the appropriate state of purity, make sure they're immunogenic in animals um, uh, before you start putting them into human beings. So, you know, I, 
this isn't always public information until a clinical trial is set up. And so I, I'm assuming that every, because I have great faith in Dr. Fauci and I know him to be extremely well-informed immunologist, viral immunologist, um, I cannot imagine we are not doing all of these things, but I just think um, the public should know that this is, this, this should be an all hands on deck effort. And uh, uh, I, I don't happen to know whether every single one of the vectors I just mentioned are being tested. I'd be surprised, however, if they were not. So in terms of timing, you know, you, you gave this time frame of, you know, potentially around 18 months for having this online. Um, At the early. Can you give, I mean, so that's a little more conservative than um, some of the other estimates that we'd heard that it might be ready in the first half of next year. Um, is, is what you're talking about uh, that the time frame for this being widely available um, in the U.S., for example, or are you talking about um, in the U.S. up into to billions of doses to be able to administer around the world? Well, um, you can't ramp up something into the billions of doses range until you're certain that it is both safe and efficacious, right? And um, uh, it's just not economically viable to do that for 16 different preparations. And, uh, uh, so I think, you know, to me, what I've heard Dr. Fauci say publicly is 12 to 18 months to de de deployment at the earliest, you know, if the nucleic acid based vaccines work, you know, that you're at the 12 month end of that range for deployment. Uh, now, I don't know if, if he's talking about deployment globally, or if he's talking about deployment in the U S because obviously the scale up necessary for global distribution is quite profound, but there are also many other institutions that can participate in that scale up. You know, there are lots of biotech firms in India and China that specialize in the production of high volume, low margin products like vaccines. And I don't think, I think that most vaccine manufacturers would be inclined to partner with a whole series of those uh, enterprises in order to make the global distribution, you know, possible, which is, you know, it's what it's going to take. But I think that 12 to 18 month time frame, which I think is itself an optimistic one, um, is for American deployment. And then what do you think, just typically from your time in industry, how long do you think it would take to be able to scale up, to be able to deliver this um, globally in billions of doses after that? You know, I, I'm really not sure I can answer that question. Um, you know, by the time I was at Novartis, Novartis got out of its, sold its vaccine business to another manufacturer. So I was never deeply involved in the manufacturing part of vaccine production, um, but it's a big endeavor to scale up. And uh, my guess is that a, a variety of generic firms overseas would be taking that responsibility on in partnership with their American or, or European uh, counterparts. Uh, I don't think any single company could probably meet the entire global demand, um, but these are things that I'd be speculating about. I, I wouldn't want to put a timeline on that. Um, you can bet it would be a very high priority and, and banked fully by governments and charities as well as the private sector. Yeah, so I, I wanna be sensitive to time because we've been going for about an hour. Um, but before we wrap up, is there anything that we haven't gotten a chance to cover that you wanna make sure that we cover or anything that you wanna reinforce? Um, no, I think we've pretty much hit all the high points. Um, All right. We haven't talked much about what strategies, how you would deploy these to come out of uh, an epidemic, but uh, that's probably going to take a little bit of time. And but I think these are the tests that we need to have, and we need to understand how they how to use them in order to think about how to come out of a lockdown. What would a staged exit from a lockdown look like? Um, maybe we save that for another time. Yeah, I think that'll be one of the next um, one, one of the next um, lives that we do. We'll, we'll probably be on that topic. Anyway, yeah. um, Don, thank you so much for for joining us. This has been really interesting, and and we covered a, a lot of ground. So um, thank yeah, you too. not only for joining us today and helping to explain some of these um, ideas about what needs to happen to to uh, people broadly, but I also appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, as, a, as an important advisor to the Biohub and helping with the efforts there. So thank you for everything that you do. It's great to see you. Thanks, Stay Don. well. Stay well. Good thank all you right. very much. Everyone My pleasure. Thanks for having me. For everyone on the, on, the, on the stream, I hope you're all 
um, staying well, staying healthy and, and safe. Um, and we will see you all soon.